Hello, everyone. Welcome to the weekly TSC call. As you know, this is a public call. Everybody's welcome to join, listen in, participate. There are two requirements to doing so. The first one is to be aware and live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is currently displayed, and the code of conduct, which is linked from the agenda. So, we have a fairly light agenda, I believe, today, but I wanted to take advantage of the time to try to make progress of some of the pending issues we have anyway, and for which we don't seem to get as much offline discussion as I was hoping for. So it's okay, we can use the online time <laughs> instead. So, but let's get started with the announcements. I don't know that there is anything new per se. We have the usual reminder about the newsletter. Right, you want to do your spiel? Sure, it's a, it's a great way for projects to uh, celebrate their successes. I know that uh, uh, ICAPI uh, had a, a significant release in the previous uh, newsletter and we can't help you get the word out if you don't help us help you get the word out. So help us. All right. All right. Thank you. Is there any other announcements anybody wants to make? Okay. I don't hear anybody. Don't see any hands going up. So I assume there isn't. So in terms of quality reports, so we still have the cactus reports report, sorry, on the, um, on that's from the week before. I, from what I could tell, most of the TSC members have reviewed it. I didn't see any issues that required uh, discussion at this point. We also got two new reports, namely from Fabric and Sawtooth. I know they came in just a day or two ago. And so there's more mixed uh, status there. We will just carry those over to next week. Uh, I didn't see anything that required discussion at this point either, but we'll give everybody a chance to raise any issues um, until next week. So I'll keep those two for on, the, on next week's agenda. So let's get to this discussion. The main one I want to talk about, and there may be another one we can also tackle. Oh, we'll see. But uh, first, I wanted to get more into this incubation entry considerations. So it's uh, we had like three of our members, uh, four that really contributed uh, to the document. And uh, there hasn't been much comments beyond those like three or four people. I have personally read it and I had a couple of comments that I kept for this call. But um, otherwise, I thought, you know, we should just take the time to read through this together and, and decide whether there are any issues that need to be discussed or we can agree on what the text says. So um, before I wanted to ask if any of body has anything specific they wanted to raise on this document, or if not it's anything, you know, we can go through it as we go down the document but I wanted to give a chance if there's anybody who has an urge to discuss a particular point to raise it now. Okay, I don't see any, uh, Hot, go ahead. Hey, um, I think I commented on this on the very end, but I was wondering uh, if people thought we should have a community section as well. Obviously we want to separate this from the community requirements for active status. Uh, but it seems like we still probably want uh, some, you know, we want some properties of a community, I guess. Um, so I just, I added some stuff in there in a comment and I just was curious what people thought about that. Okay, so this is, you're saying there's a, probably a new section. We have those sections today touching different aspects and you're saying we probably ought to have another sections around the community. That's okay. right. So let's jump to that maybe, or do we go through this and then get to that 
I don't know. Whatever's fine. We don't have to do it right now. Okay, Let, let's go over what's already in the document and then will, everybody will be on the same page and we can see, you know, we'll have better context for the section you want to add. So let's get going. So first there's the goal that Arun uh, stated. Does anybody have any comment on this? I hope everybody has actually had a look at this document at least once. I'm not going to literally read every sentence of the document. I just want to quickly through, work through this and like section by section, ask if there's anything that, you know, uh, needs to be discussed or if we agree, then we just, you know, say, okay, this can stay in the document. And then uh, by the end of this process, we should have a document we all feel comfortable with. So, yeah, so one of the things about the goal question I have, it states in use, but that's not even a requirement that if you used in active, unless I'm not remembering all the requirements. Okay. Arun, go ahead. Yeah, no, no. Um, hi, team. So I saw a hard question earlier today, and I commented on that, um, uh, on this question in the comment section in the wiki. If you can scroll down to this page. Um, um, so my intent was that we identify that there is high potential for this project to be in hyperledger space. Either it can be a demand from the community that, hey, we don't have a project like this. And so there is a high, uh, high need for this project to be within hyperledger or other thing could be um, showcase that this project is really in production. So I, I mean, um, to grow it further, Hyperledger could be a good place to grow. So that's, we, I don't know the, about the exact words. I, I didn't know that these two words could cause confusions. We could probably re rephrase them. All right, so by the way, Rai pointed out, I actually meant to do exactly that, right? So thanks for pointing it out. Uh, there is a new chat system that we're supposed to try out. So, uh, Right, put the link in the chat window of the Zoom meeting. I invite everybody to click on the link. If it works, I don't know, it doesn't work for me. And we can use that instead of the TSC rocket chat channel we normally use in the background. Thank you. Okay, with that done, uh, let's get back to Aaron's point. So I, I I do agree with a bit with Dano that you know I don't know that we've ever asked whether a, you know for a project to be in use and even less so like you know uh, and. Do we ask some evidence of that or is it just a claim good enough? And does it do us any good? If I wanted to, I can always claim that that's the case. And I don't know how we would go to proving it anyway. So I'm not completely sure this is actionable per se. Tracy? Yeah, I think the in use phrase in that sentence was uh, also something that caught me. Um, and I, so I was, I guess I was trying to see if in my mind I could combine conceptually and imp implement it and in use to reflect the fact that, you know, if something is just an idea, it's probably better to start that in a lab space than it is to start it in um, as, a, as a top level project, right? Uh, but I, I do think that the in use phrase is definitely a, a question about what exactly we mean there and, and how do we how do we enforce something like that? Uh, because it could very well be that the, the developer who is bringing this to the TSC says, well, I'm using it, right? Is that enough? Um, yeah, you know, there's there's no real there's no real uh, point at which we would say, oh yes, this is something that 
uh, is used by five people or 10 people or 15 people, right? What is that magic number that we would say, yes, I, I, I agreed to this as a project that is in use and makes sense to me. I think it's very subjective. And, um, and so I, I would recommend striking at least the in use uh, portion of that, that goal. Okay, Daniel. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what Tracy said. I think one of the concerns I have is we don't want to introduce standards that are probably appropriate for active status. You know, I think the the evidence of a of community use of actual production use, I think, is a good one. But I don't know that incubation is the right place to bring that in. And the standards again are kind of you know how do we go about that? And um, you know, if, if we if we phrase it too loosely, um, it just becomes you know, the appearance of a standard, but really it's the whims of the TSC. If it's the whims of the TSC, let's just leave it at that. Um, but I agree with the premise that proof of concept is a good stage for um, bringing stuff in incubation. If you just have an idea that you should make sure that it, it, it works in at least one iteration, even if it is on your machine. Um, and labs is the right place to pursue ideas. And incubation is a place where you start productizing those ideas into what would be an active project eventually. Then you have a, a path to get there that people reasonably believe. And I mean, one other data point, if I may, I mean, looking back, it's pretty clear to me that, you know, most of the projects when they started, they didn't have, you know, definitely production use. <laughs> I mean, Way back at the very beginning, obviously, everything was brand new, just out of like development still, you know, I mean, we didn't have enough in a kind of major version. When you think about the first project that came in, whether it's fabric, so tooth, any of those, they were really early on. So tooth just came out of research at Intel, right? And they didn't have anywhere near, they were nowhere near production use. So I think we need to be reasonable there and indeed try to, if I would agree that, you know, if there is no code at all, then I would agree say, well, go do this in the lab. But if there's already code and you can already play around with it, even if it's not in production yet, I think incubation seems to be the right spot to be in. So. Does anybody disagree with this? Seems like you know those who have, who have spoken basically are saying let's drop that part. Hot. I was just going to comment that if we are going to leave things sort of at the whim of the TSC, and maybe you know like is a project relevant, is something that's hard to define. We should write some examples of things that are sort of like clearly relevant and clearly not relevant to sort of give people guidelines. If we're... Okay. Yeah, we can illustrate a bit by giving some examples. All right, so can we go back to the beginning of the document, please? Right. And let's see if we can change this then to something we can agree with uh, on. Would you prefer to share your screen so that you can type? No, I mean, I'm not claiming to be the master of the document for that matter. Uh, okay, well, I, I was- But uh, I mean, And this is editable by all, right? Yes. Yeah, everyone, you know, feel free to jump in and edit and your- So I can we agree to just drop any news? We can say the project should be conceptually implemented, although that alone may be loaded. And as it was pointed out, do we have to define what that means? Is your hand up, Hart? Oh, sorry, I meant to lower it after the last comment. Okay, so I'm proposing to just drop any news. Anybody disagree with it? 
can we leave with the sentence I, I, and I for one don't really understand what conceptually implemented means <laughs> okay so Arun you wrote this can you explain what you were thinking about right so um uh, so when I wrote this, the thought was very simple that when a new project is proposed, it should not be just a thought that, hey, I can do a project with an idea like this, right? Uh, and for example, um, let's say somebody comes and says, yeah, I have a cool new project proposal, which is like a multi-party system, which would do uh, something else. Now that type ledger is allowing multi-party systems, I would be doing these X, Y, Z things. So I need a place and I think this is the name of my project. So I'm, I'm coming to Hyperledger. So that's what I meant uh, with conceptually implemented. It, it is to say that, hey, it's fine. You have an idea. The project is uh, well documented or well approached towards it. However, for you to come and collaborate here, there should be um, something that you showcase and it, it should be in real, right? And um, it should, when you say you're coming and proposing that project, it should be, it, it should have those things that you claim in the charter, project's charter. So we already have that next section on the code base. I mean, that does imply there is some code. Do we need to say more or isn't that enough? It says the code should exist as open source software in some form. And to me, maybe that's good enough. The rest becomes very subjective as to how much code there is, how much does it cover from the goal of the project, you know, and then we, I don't know that it adds much to have that sentence. Maybe we drop the whole sentence. Mark? Do we need to have code to start a project? That's what we are saying, yes. I think for incubation, yes. Um, if it's just an idea and code's being generated, I think labs or governance outside of Hyperledger might be a better place to do it. I personally would expect something that you get boot up and run and say, oh, gee, that's neat, um, if it's going to come in incubation. Mark, do you think that's too much asking? You would uh, think starting on an idea alone is good enough? I'm just wondering about efforts. <clears throat> I guess efforts that aren't code are, tend to be working groups or SIGs. So maybe, you know, maybe this will help with the distinction between them to say projects need code. I see. Have we had a lab or a project that's come out of a working group or a task force yet? If there is, that would be an excellent example to put into this documentation. There have been labs from SIG, yes. They Tracy. haven't, yeah. Tracy. Yeah, so uh, I did make a edit so that people can see it on the screen um, uh, with a suggestion of what we could change it to. So um, don't know if this is where we wanna go to move us forward or um, if we still wanna keep discussing the same, same thing. No, I'm happy with that. I thank you for taking the lead on editing the document. Bobby. Hi, um, just speaking from the Learning Materials Working Group, we had um, two projects, um, the university course and the starter lab go into Hyperledger Labs. And we're also working on a, a third one, which is the giving chain. So in my interpretation, we're going to um, go through the lab process first, copy code from one of the blockchains and tweak it for our project. And then we're going to test it on a project day and if that works, that's when we'd probably do the steps for incubation so that it's been kind of proof of concept once. And if it works, 
we would move it out of the labs. If it doesn't, we would still continue in the labs until it does. All right, thank you. Yeah, that seems too much uh, other, body, other people's expectation. So now I, I'm wondering whether we should still have something about the code given what we just said with Mark and all. I mean, I mean, it is a way to have a distinction be, you know, this is the expectation of a project is that it will have code, a project in incubation. Maybe we just put something about code for the project already exists and that's it. We don't get into, you know, how much code. Uh, we just say there's got to be some code that exists. And then, of course, if somebody comes with two line pieces of code, we're going to laugh and say, sorry, that's not good enough. It, do, it does seem like a strong um, pushback uh, on the last proposal for entry into project incubation was based on code being available, but not having been publicly open source for a while. It wasn't even available at first. We had a push to get it open source. Right. Yeah, you know, so let's be clear. I'm not. I'm not saying to drop that thing, uh, that sentence about the code base being open. Uh, I'm still talking about the goal, just adding something about the fact that the code exists, which now we have lost entirely. We went from the product shall be conceptually implemented and in use to nothing at all, which I'm worried that we're missing the, the distinction we've been uh, stressing, which is that and for labs, it might be okay to just start with an idea, but for project, there should already be code that you can use. So I, I would like that to be present in that sentence if that's the main statement we people will look at. We've never incubated a project without code, right? That's the point. So I think that has to be in there in that first sentence. Tracy, is your hand up? Yes, my hand is up. Okay. Um, I, I think we're, I think we're confusing goal with the criteria or the considerations, right? I think the goal of, I think as I read a goal, it's the goal for incubation. What is what is incubation? Um, is it's, it's not the the considerations, and to me the considering that the very first thing is talking about the code base and code should exist as a consideration. That seems to, I don't know, just seems duplicative and, and okay, not, that's a good point. not goal like. <laughs> I, 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 I think that's a valid point. So with that, I'm happy to leave it as is then. Okay, everybody happy with the goal? Can we move on? So let's get to the code base. I mean, hot, I suppose that, do you have, we have to, sorry. Yeah, can we get rid of your comment there? That's exactly what I meant to say. Yeah, go ahead and delete it. Okay, so the code base, Dino added a bunch of points about the code being actually to exist as open source. Uh, there's a piece on the Apache software license I mean, is there any of this that anybody wants to discuss? Or are we happy with what's there? Or is there anything people want to add? So Hot raised the question. Yeah. So, Can we just move this the Apache 2 stuff under legal? Uh, it's probably a better fit there. And we may have, we can talk about other stuff as well like dependent licenses, which are always a, a thorny issue. That sounds fine. While that's being moved, um, I don't think we should have CI/CD requirements in there because 
they won't have access to hyperledger CICD, and that's really what matters. And I'll add to Dano's point that actually obtaining the CICD is like a big incentive for people to uh, apply for incubation. You mean, yeah, that's not something they, that's available to the labs. And so a project moving to incubation will get this as a benefit. So yeah, it's a bit unfair to request people to have that if we're not giving them the way to do it, the means to do, do it. Do we need to let people coming in know that that's expectation that they will have resources to handle CICD and things like that? I'm assuming Rye doesn't do it for every project, right? Uh, yeah, that's old Rye. Um, so this, that you, you've touched on a really thorny issue that I, I am holding my tongue on because I don't want to divert this meeting. So let's just say that CICD is difficult and not drill into it very deeply in this meeting, please. Okay. Sorry. But <laughs> is it the fact that it's not part of the labs, right? My goal would be that everyone migrates to uh, GitHub Actions and then labs get to do it for free because everyone gets right. to do it for free. So yes and no. The part that isn't is publishing to Docker Hub, except we, we do allow labs to publish Docker Hub. So there's not much incentive. There was a bunch of incentive when we were spending a lot of money on CICD. Now we aren't. So okay, let me give a, a, higher, a higher level goal of mine, which is to never have a resource uh, uh, you know, be a resource limit or a budget limit be a reason why we have to say no to taking on a new project. That's a goal, and it's an ideal. Maybe ideal is a better way of phrasing it than a goal. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't want that to be a reason why somebody said we can't take a project on. All right, Chrissy. Yeah, so I assume we're talking about Arun's comment here in the code base. I'm wondering if, I mean, we don't have this checklist today. I'm wondering if we can take these individual ideas that Arun has put out here for the checklist and put them in the correct spots, right? So like DCO requirements would fall under the code base. Uh, the file structure repo requirement would fall under code base. The license copyright is probably illegal. Um, I'm not sure where the release process goes, but uh, maybe that's under the community section that Hart wants to add. I agree with you, Tracy. I think that's a very good point. It's, I, I had the, I, the same thoughts when I read it yesterday. I mean, Arun, you, there are a couple of places where you refer to something that's yet to be defined and as if it's gonna be defined elsewhere. And I think we should instead define it right here so that we don't have this kind of interaction like this in this case, the checklist, like, well, no, just put right here the, the, what you would have in that checklist. Um, yeah, no, no hard comments. The only reason why I put this over here is because this was related to code base and we had to make sure that these are met as part of the code base that is being brought in. Sure, I, I guess it makes sense. We can move them to appropriate sections. And at the end, we could probably have a checklist for somebody and ask them a few questions. Hey, have you done this, this? As a reminder. Yeah, okay. So for DCO, are we expecting that they're actually gonna have to have done the squash recommit um, if they don't have it in their full history? before they sign off or are they supposed to do DCO um, the exceptions with the list of hashes that don't have it? I mean, are we expecting them to do that before they propose? We're expecting that to happen pretty quick when they come into incubation. Hmm. Good question. 
Tracy, you have an answer to propose? Your hand is up. Uh, no, I, did, I was going to make a comment on <laughs> something else. I was going to bring up something else. So um, I'll let other people comment on that. Leave my hand up until this is finished. Um, uh, yeah, we may need to actually have a conversation with LF legal on that particular point with the DCO, so. Yeah, but Sorry. Dino's point I think is valid is that, you know, if people just want to make a proposal and imagine we say no, maybe they don't care to go through the old DCO stuff. So should the DCO be a requirement to be able to, to get into incubation as opposed to something they have to do as part of like importing their code in the, you know, once yeah. they have been approved. In, in the past for projects before, DCO never existed before the project came in, but you needed to be able to pass the DCO requirements as part of bringing your code in. Right, and that historically that meant a squash commit. If you look at the Hyperledger archives uh, org in GitHub, that's where all of the pre-squash uh, fabric repos live um, so that we didn't lose that history. Uh, so I, I think it's reasonable to say you can get into incubation without actually doing the squash or doing the DCO piece, but when the code comes in, it needs to be compliant. And I see Grace and Tracy still have their hands up. So Tracy, I suppose is still for something else. Yep. So yep. I'll yep. Skip. Grace maybe wants to react to what's being talked about here. Yeah, no, I, I just want to echo Rye. I think it's fine to, uh, or my proposal would be what Rye just said, which was, you know, it can be as a, it doesn't have to be done before they are approved as an incubation project. I think that's okay, reasonable so and, and it's worked all right um, in the past. Okay, so Tracy added, uh, or oh, is it Dano wrote a sentence? I wrote it. To clarify, giving a, a bit of leeway as to, you know, whether the DCO sign off exists or not. I think that's reasonable. It sets the expectation and it doesn't make it a hard requirement to have the DCO sign off already. In. And just as a point of information, I've seen other projects start doing DCO that don't have Linux Foundation connection. So I think there's a chance we could see projects come in that are DCO ready. Now, my question is going to be, does that really belong to the code base or does it belong to the legal part? I think the, that's the challenge of these different sections is some things kind of overlap. Practically everything code base is legal, it seems like. <laughs> I'm assuming anything coming in from a lab would already have DCO? Yes. They should. I mean, we do request, we enforce that very requirement when they bring a new repository and they are instructed to keep the sign, the DCO sign offs as they progress. I don't know, you know, so yeah, they should be in position to do that. Yes. Of course, we, we, we not the police, we don't go after them and check that they actually do it. So there may be cases where they say, oops, sorry, we forgot to do that. But at least the expectation is there. So repository comply with the common repository structure, I think is an interesting one. I also wonder whether this is something that couldn't be led to the incubation phase. Yeah, so Arno, this is where my hand was up. When I typed that, I was like, I don't, I don't think this is actually incubation criteria, even though it was included in Arun's comment here. Um, I, I think that it's very possible that somebody comes in without having compliance to the, the common repository structure. And then upon entry, they would, you know, add the required files. So I, I feel like this one 
as well as the copyright one that I added under legal is really um, more upon entry, right? It's not something that we would consider and reject the project because it doesn't have the common repository structure. That's also my feeling. Uh, I think there may be things for which it's a must, like the copyright and the license, you know, that you would expect a project to have that. Maybe. Could I but, could I propose that the, the TSC use the same requirements for the CRF as uh, uh, they do for existing projects? I, I think uh, projects had two quarters to get in compliance or two quarterly reports to get into compliance with that. I mean, wouldn't that be a reasonable thing if you're bringing in the code base to say you have six months to get this stuff in shape or like your second quarterly report? All right, that's, that's an interesting idea. So it's somewhere in between. We don't ask them to have it done to enter incubation, but we don't want to wait until they graduate for that either. So we kind of force them to do it in a, you know, shortly after they start the enter incubation. I, I, I like that proposal. Tracy, your hand is up. Is it? Sorry, I think I didn't lower it. All right. Although I don't, I don't know that we need to put anything in this document. So Rune, I don't know that we actually need to put any statement in this. I think it, we could add it to the project checklist if it's not already there, um, that already exists, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I don't think it has to be here, but we somehow have to make sure it's captured somewhere. So I don't know where that is. <laughs> we would, we should check. So I know it's a little off topic, but it ties in. I think all these things we're discussing would be requirements to get to a graduated state. And so I think if we have a clear list of, you know, I mean, for existing projects out there coming in, you know, this could be why they're in incubation is to get all these things done. Does that sound reasonable? That's what's happened in the past. So I think it's reflecting in reality. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Okay, so, is there anything else we want to take from that point from Arun? Yeah, I, I would just say that all of these items are probably items that should be part of entering active state, right? Um, because I think the release process is even one of those things uh, that, you know, in the past, we've had projects that have come in who haven't necessarily done releases in the open, if you will, um, and have had to, to figure out as a community how to, to really work through the process of doing releases and uh, so I would say like that's probably, if you're not doing releases by the time you become active, that's probably a, a reason not to become active. Yeah, I agree. So Arun, may I suggest you move that point to maybe the comments or at the bottom as a note or something we need to check that these things are covered as part of, you know, maybe the exit criteria for incubation, maybe something else if the case might be but we don't have to have it there. I don't want to lose it because I think you make, you know, these are important aspect, but I think they are not part of this uh, entry considerations. So let's move on to the maintainers section. So there, I don't know that everybody is in agreement on, on the points that have been put forward. So anybody wants to speak up? Dano, go ahead. 
So I think whatever we do in the maintainer section should reflect what has actually happened in previous proposals. Um, I know we have rejected a project for having only a single maintainer, but I don't know that we rejected a project because the proposed initial maintainers were all from one company. If there is, then I think, you know, we can go with that and should document examples of where that happened. So I have to admit not to know the answer which way it is regarding the history. I know that we, and, and this somewhat relates to, you know, there's been this question about uh, sponsors and, you know, people were committed to the project. And this, there was a bit of confusion, I think rightly so, because it's not defined currently, like what's the meaning of those things. What I think has been the case for the most part, at least the main projects where there were at least two companies saying, yes, I think we should do this and I'm committing resources to this. And, you know, you can, you can then debate whether they, you know, they live up to that commitment or not, at least to the extent that someone might have expected, but at least on, the, on paper at the time they made the proposal, there was this expectation, this commitment. I think it's, I feel like this might be more important than specifically the maintainers aspect. So maintainers, let's be clear. I mean, what does it, you know, what does it translate to if there are, if there's more than one maintainer, what does that, you know, represent practically speaking that we should care about? Grace. I think there are two questions you're asking. So I think it's one, um, maintainers should be, there should be multiple maintainers uh, potentially from one organization. I think the other question you're asking just to be really clear is sponsors. And maybe we add a bullet in or declare what, um, what a sponsor is or means. Um, Cause I think that's a, a, like an important distinction there. So maintainers could be, you know, uh, the people that are actually working on the code base sponsors are people who are excited about, I think we should define what a sponsor is to make that more clear. Cause I think sponsors historically have been used as advocates for the project, but not necessarily contributors to the project. Does that make it? Yeah, I think you're right. Thank you for bringing that up. Arun. Hey, um, so I guess this question came up about maintainers in the last conversation. Um, because there was few open, I mean, open questions around the governance aspect for any project that is beginning to um, get, beginning to get into open source. The the item that was, I guess, it was Dano who brought out this. Um, the governance part is more important, or if they are more familiar with the way of working in in silos in within the organization, and when they come to open source, that they should have a mechanism of getting others in as well. So if we can try to answer that part through this maintainer section, probably that might help. And, and my comment over there is actually to address that part that in terms of governance, hey, what if, what if you have somebody, um, I mean, demonstrate that you are collaborating with somebody else before you came in for this project. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's my comment on that topic. All right, thank you, Mark. So I remember discussions in the past um, where I think we delayed projects um, because they did not have a diverse maintainers list. And the concern was always, well, if it's all from one company, what happens if that company tires of Hyperledger? You know, what happens to that project, to that investment that Hyperledger's made? Um, when you have maintainers from multiple companies, then, you know, you have a better chance that that project's going to live on if one, pro one company leaves. So I think that's where the distinction comes in between, you know, people who are, I mean, what has happened and before the proposal and, and what's expected. And that's where it brings me back to the point I was touching on earlier which is in the past, you know, you had company that just open source their code and then said, hey, 
we would like to bring this. And another company had not necessarily been involved up to that point, but would say, yes, and I'm interested and I, you know, I, I commit, uh, I will commit resources towards it. So from that point of view, you know, they wouldn't have the maintainers yet. We wouldn't have the diversity of maintainers on the existing code, but the expectations we would get it. And it's very much into your point, Mark, where, you know, there is the, the survival of the, the project, the long-term, right, is at stake on that front. Tracy. Yeah, I just add that obviously that's part of why we have the requirement to leave incubation right, and to become graduated um, is kind of a multiple maintainers piece. I, I think we're requiring multiple maintainers from multiple companies coming in to incubation is somewhat adding a new rule that none of the other projects had to comply with per se. Um, and I think that could be a, a challenge for bringing projects in that could very well make it to a graduated state at some point in the future um, after they after people see and, and start to realize that there's something good happening with this project and they want to get involved. So how about, you know, I understand, I mean, Dino started from what he thought was this kind of the status quo on, you know, how things have played out and around this notion of maintainers. Personally, I don't feel that, you know, focusing on the maintainers aspect is necessarily the right uh, consideration. I, I would be happier to say that we have to have, you know, like uh, committed uh, companies, more than one company committed to the project. And, and yes, sir. That, that falls under the sponsors, does it, Arno? So maybe, but as Grace was pointing out, I think, Historically, sponsors have not always, they, they, we have had this distinction where there are people who say that they want to be sponsored to say, I support this idea without necessarily committing to it, to, to contributing themselves, right? I mean, whether it's a person or a company for that matter. So there may be a worthwhile discussion, di di uh, distinction there between something that's like supporters and sponsors, or I don't know how we call those things, but one where we say, you know, and I think that the heap the template uh, does have that. There is a section on sponsors and a section on resources. Yeah, so just FYI, I did go through old, um, all of the existing kind of proposals that we had out there for projects. Um, at least the projects that we have today. <laughs> and there's a lot of wiggle words being used when it comes into that efforts and resources section. Um, and I think it would be very easy to have a lot of wiggle room and for it to be said in a way that implies that there's more support than there actually is. Um, so we, we just need to be careful, right, that we're we're not uh, restricting and adding kind of new new rules to this efforts and resources section. Um, yeah, I, I recommend if you want to go to go read through some of the proposals and um, see exactly what I'm talking about because it, it was interesting. Um, and, and the you know uh, so op open and honest here, right? Like. The reason I went through and looked is because we're interested in bringing the blockchain automation framework as a top level project. Um, and we do have people who have committed from multiple organizations based on the metrics, but I can't guarantee you that they're going to actually commit to continuing that. Uh, but yet I could say, hey, we've got six different organizations that have committed to this, uh, to this lab. So, you know, I, I just, I'm a little worried, right, that, that we're, trying to add something that can't necessarily be met and that could be easily wiggled around. Um, so just just some, but, some thoughts no, about that. I, I totally understand where you're coming from. And that's why, you know, I, I did say, you know, I think in the past we had companies that committed to certain project that didn't necessarily live up to that, uh, you know, yeah. commitment. I think that's a fact and, and that will always be the case. 
that's why also I think there's a general agreement among the TSC members that you know we want these things to be as subject as objective as possible, and yet we understand that there's always ways to to you know game this thing either intentionally or not uh, for that matter because a company might very well intend to commit resources and then things change for whatever reason six months later they're gone and what are you going to do sue them <laughs> so i think we have to accept that but yet i think there is some value in asking you know if there are companies committed to this but so i i wanted to go back to the maintainers just a moment there because i on my problem with what's the way it's it is now is that well we say a project should have multiple maintainers and yeah they could be from the same company and then i'm like what is that achieving because you know very much in line with what you're saying tracy if i if i want to submit a proposal i guarantee my project is going to have more than one maintainer that's easy to get i can get any of my buddies to sign up even if it's just on paper right so we can always game the, these things. So, so I don't know that we are achieving, I don't know. I, I would say don't try to solve every problem up front. Um, I don't think that we've had anything. Uh, I don't think that we've had anyone acting in bad faith when they brought a project in. And you know things may have changed, and their focus may have shifted. But I don't think any company brought in a project and tried to like submarine it and get it in there and make it look like there was a whole bunch of interest in it when there wasn't. So I, I just leave I room. Think that's the right point. You're, you're probably right there. Yeah, just assume good intent, and you know, it's like when we discuss the eligibility list for for the election. Oh, no. always remind us that it's easy to to fake it and have a whole bunch of email registered i was i was having a good day you had to bring up the election <laughs> yeah it's coming up isn't it yes anyway let, we have five more minutes let's take uh, the topic at hand for now so Dano, I mean, I know you put that in because you thought this reflects what has been done in the past, but how do you actually feel about this? Do you think this has value? I do, because if there's only one person maintaining code and they tire the project and leave, you're completely high and dry. Whereas if there's multiple maintainers, if one person goes on vacation for too long, the other people can step in. and. You know, as far as open source projects, I think the magic number is three people. If one person, two people have a disagreement of code, the third person can break the tie. But I think the only thing that historically has been done, Soleil was rejected because there was really only one person writing the code and maintaining it. And I think that example is something that's been done and it's a precedent. And I think we should go forward with it or we should explicitly repeal it. Um, and I think the better, from a project health perspective, it's, it's a really bad sign if you only have one maintainer when you bring it to incubation. It's a great place for labs and you can grow it up to two or three maintainers there and then bring it in. But, you know, I'm... All right. You need, you need more than one person looking at the code. No, you convinced me. I think that's good. Let's keep it. It kind of is a very clear uh, criteria that, you know, should... Even, I mean, people who are genuinely, you know, wondering... Oh, could I become a project with an hyperledger? They'll look at it and they've been working this project on their own for a while. And then they'll say, oh, I guess not. And that's probably a good thing. Yeah, going from one maintainer to two is a lot harder than going from three to four. So that's the hardest bump. Yep. Okay, so then we have a couple of points from Arun. Uh, Tracy has our hand up. Yeah, so for the first one, the plan to promote contributors and to maintainers. Again, I think this is a uh, definitely something that we would want for active, but I don't know that it's something that is required for incubation. I don't know that I've ever looked for this when I've been looking at a project that's going to come into incubation. Um, so I would suggest that we move this to, to the 
active criteria, if you will. I'm sorry, graduated criteria. Yep, I would agree as well. Arun, is that okay with you? Oh, I heart had his hand raised before me. Oh, but yeah, I mean, going by the recent conversation that happened with one of the project that came up for the proposal, we did bring this up during that time. And we said, hey, do you have a plan for bringing in additional contributors? If you don't, I mean, this was brought up in, in that discussion. Yeah, but so do you think this is required for a project being proposed for incubation? That so they already have that plan? Yes, so what all that we are asking for is a plan. Right? Hey, do you have a plan to increase maintainers or do you have you documented a way so that if somebody is interested in this project, they can see this as an incentive that they become maintainers and steer the direction of the project um, along with you in open governance. So, um, probably I still feel it is good to have document. All right, so Arun seems to believe that this is a requirement to enter incubation. Tracy said she thinks it's to exit incubation. So how do other people feel? Feel. We are gonna to have to cut it one way or the other. I'm also with Tracy. I think this is something that can be left to the incubation phase. Art has a hand up. Yep. Um, do do even look, do most of our projects have this documented? So I'm just wondering whether most of our actual projects in incubation have this documented. So I, okay, so the, maybe it depends how you read this, I suppose. I mean, from my point of view, there's whether, you know, we have requested the doc, the policy on how to become a contributor to be posted, right? And I hope projects have that documented. I would say Bezu has the best documentation of process on tra transition of all of the projects. So I would just use Bezu as a model. Yeah, I mean, I think most projects have like how to contribute posted but i don't know that a lot of them have like how do you become a maintainer what's the process fabric does i i understand fabric does but it's i'm guessing it's probably the exception rather than the rule i think we need another six month mandate because i think how to become a maintainer should be established a priority but maybe i'm in the minority well i was this is how to become a maintainer. That was the document I was specifically referring to, Bezu being a good model. Um, so I agree, by the way. Bezu has that done that very well. I looked at it and I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. Okay, we're out of time, but Tracy, let's go back to Tracy. Do you have something else you wanted to bring up? Yeah, I think we're talking about two different things here. I think we're talking about how do we get more contributors to a project, which we see to have a lot of projects want to enter incubation for that purpose, right? And then this statement as it's written is more talking about how do you promote contributors into maintainers, which was definitely not um, something that we have talked about in the past. So let's just uh, be clear on what we're trying to accomplish with this particular rule. And um, I do not think that having a plan to promote contributors into maintainers is something that we should require. All right, thank you, Tracy. So let's uh, keep hammering that one. I would uh, and, you know, be happy if people could continue the discussion offline so we can make progress. It's obviously a bit difficult to do that with everybody on. I mean, but we will keep doing it until we get that done. I think it's an important piece of work. With that being said, I will let you all go. Thank you all for joining. We'll talk again next week.